Welcome back. We are in chapter 10, section 3. Today we're going to talk about calculating principal components for two variables. Before we do that, we are going to do a little review on some notation from linear algebra. Turns out that when you're working with big multivariate data sets, it's common to represent things as matrices. Your notation gets a lot nicer. There's way less pieces involved. You don't have to sum things. Uh, it makes things very nice. So we need to talk a little bit about matrices and vectors. For this example, consider the first five rows of the 2006 stocks data set. So here's the first five, row, first five rows. Um, we've also got four columns going on here. So we've got the Dow Jones, the S&P, NASDAQ, and a date. We're going to focus in on just those first two, just to make things simple. These first two columns could re be represented as two vectors, x1 and x2. And notice my notation here. It's a lowercase x, and it is bold. So a bold lowercase x with a subscript of 1 and a subscript of 2. So there's, those are going to be column vectors, and they're going to have 251 observations each. Where did the 251 come from? Well, we're only looking at the first five rows of this data set just to get a picture of it, but the data set has 251 observations because that's how many business days there were in 2006. So that's where that number came from. And those two vectors could be combined into what would then be a 251 by 2 matrix, which we're going to call capital X. And again, it's bold. So vectors usually get lowercase bold letters. Uh, matrices get uppercase bold letters. A single number would get a lowercase uh, not bold letter. And 251 by 2. So when we talk about matrices, it's always uh, rows by columns. So 251 rows and two columns. That's where those numbers came from. And what is a matrix? Well, it's a rectangular array of numbers. The rows the rows of a matrix can be called row vectors, the columns can be called column vectors. So if I throw out any of those terms, that's what I'm talking about. R can do this, so you can make matrices in R. The matrix and as.matrix functions uh, can be helpful to us. So first off, what about just the matrix function? So this is kind of helpful if you're creating your own matrix. Um, so first what I do here is the first argument is I create a vector, so C and then 1, 2, comma, and so on. Uh, that creates a vector. So I've got the vector from 1 to 12, so I give it that. Then I tell it I want three rows and four columns. So that's going to make a matrix, a 3 by 4 matrix for us. It's called fake matrix. And you might be wondering, OK, three rows, four columns, great. How do I know which number is going to end up where? Like, how does it fill them in? So here is, if you printed fake matrix, here is what it would give you. So we've got three rows, four columns, and it uh, shows you the indices. So that's what those uh, brackets with a number in them are. So one comma nothing, that is saying, show me all of the columns of the first row. Nothing comma three, that would say, show me all of the rows of the third column. If you had a one comma one, that would say, show me the entry in the first row and first column where they intersect. So that's the notation going on with those indices. And you'll notice the way it fills it in is column-wise. So um, we start with the first column, 1, 2, 3, move on, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So it doesn't fill them in by row, it fills them in by column, by default. And you can also turn something that already exists into a matrix, and the as.matrix function um, can be helpful there. Uh, these are not the only two ways you can accomplish this. Um, I'm sure there are other functions that do it. These are the standard ones. Also, you can use these two in slightly differing ways, but this is just these are just two examples of how to do it. With the as.matrix function, what I did is I took the stocks data. So I read the 2006 stocks data in and called it stocks. And I said, okay, take all of the rows, so nothing, comma, the first two columns, one, comma, two, uh, one colon, two. So that's the vector from one to two. And um, then I told it, turn that into a matrix. So then if I printed it, it would look like the fake matrix, but it would have 251 rows. So I didn't print all that, but it would look similar. 
Next up, there are special matrices. One is a correlation matrix. So you've seen the correlation coefficient, r. That gives us the sample correlation between two variables. So if you're making a scatter plot, x and y, you want to know the correlation, you calculate r. We've done this. And you can get a little more specific. If you've got just x and just y, then okay, you know what r is. But maybe you have multiple x's um, and you want to know you know, specific correlations between specific variables, you want to keep track of things, you can add subscripts, so like r1, 2. Um, that would be the correlation between the vector x1 and x2. And this could be extended, so past the two variable case here, the correlation between any two variables xi and xj is, and again, remember it's a measure of a linear relationship, just to throw that in there so that we um, Remember that R is only me measuring linear associations, right? You could see a perfectly parabolic association and get a low R because that's not what it's me measuring. But that was just an aside, so um, back to this. Correlation between two variables, xi and xj, which I switched between vectors and variables. Variables are vectors, vectors are variables. That's what I'm doing here. Um, the variables xi and xj, um, that correlation would be a measure of the linear relationship between the two, between the ith and jth variables. Don't know where I was going with that, sorry. And correlation doesn't make a distinction between the explanatory and response variable. So what does that mean? That means that r12 is equal to r21. So again, that's a fact that we know. The correlation between a and b is the same as the correlation between b and a. And Here's one that maybe we didn't realize. The correlation between x1 and x2 is equal to the correlation between the standardized versions z1 and z2. So z is going to be the notation that we're using for something that has been standardized. We talked about how to standardize in the last one. So uh, correlation isn't affected by linear changes of scale. And the correlation of a variable with itself is 1. So um, that tells us some things about our correlation matrix. So a correlation matrix is a matrix called capital R that has all of your correlations between your variables in it. It's a great way to summarize all of those relationships instead of just printing out a big list of R values. And the correlation matrix is always going to be square. So the number of rows and the number of columns is equal to the number of variables that you have. It's going to have ones on the diagonal because of that last fact, right, that the correlation between a variable and itself is one. It's going to be a symmetric above and below the diagonal because of the fact a few above that, that um, the correlation between A and B is the same as the correlation between B and A. And for our simple two variable case, we can make one. So you might see it core of X um, and that's equal to capital R. Again, bold capital because it's a matrix. And that is equal to, we'll fix that. So that's going to bother me. R. R. Okay. So this is what our correlation matrix would look like for our case with just two variables. Again, you can have more than two, but this is a simple case. So you've got R11, R12, R21, R22. And remember, R11 and R22 uh, are going to be 1. And in this case, R, R12 and R21 would be the same. So calculating the correlation matrix, as I said, great way to summarize all of the relationships between all of your variables and identify any strong linear relationships. Because uh, we mentioned at the beginning of this, we're trying to see you know, we've got tons of variables. Do we need them all? Maybe if we saw that a couple were very strongly linearly related, we could use that fact to combine them and condense the number of variables that we have. This is kind of the numerical equivalent to making that scatter matrix where you could look at the different scatter plots and see how the relationships look. Now you can look at their correlations. So another thing that you might want to do with the correlation matrix, it turns out, is you might want to find the direction of the largest amount of variability. So here's a plot of the standardized Dow and S&P data, so Z1 and Z2, and then we've drew, drew an oval around it, 
and you see that the direction of the most variability is kind of up and to the right there. And so we have labeled that as a V1, labeled that as the vector V1. It turns out the vector V1 is the first eigenvector of the correlation matrix. So this is where our linear algebra skills are going to kind of come in handy, right? So we need to be able to find eigenvectors. Talk about that in a second. And the direction of the, direction of the second largest amount of variability, which is V2, it's kind of perpendicular to V1 there, uh, that, it turns out, is the second eigenvector of the correlation matrix. So eigenvectors are important to us here. And this will always be true. The first and second eigenvector of the correlation matrix will always give us the first and second um, largest amounts of variability. And that would continue on. Third would give you the third most and so on. But normally, you know, we don't care too much about that. And we only have two variables right now. So, eigenvector. We know what that is, but just as a small refresher. So I'm going to go into some of the details here, but definitely not all of them. Um, so, you know, go back, look over your linear algebra notes, kind of refresh your memory on this if it's been a while. Um, but I'm just going to give a, a brief review here because I'm uh, moving on under the assumption that you know linear algebra, so I don't want to spend too much time on it uh, and bore you. So an eigenvector of the correlation matrix R is any vector V that is parallel to RV. So what does it mean to be parallel? Well, they're parallel if one is a constant multiple of the other. So finding an eigenvector consists of finding any vector v that satisfies the equation r times v is equal to lambda v, where lambda is just a constant, and specifically it's a special one called an eigenvalue. So you've seen eigenvalues before too. The means, uh, this means multiplying the vector v by the matrix r will either stretch or sh shrink, it can either stretch or shrink the vector, but it's not going to change the direction of it. So that's important, that's the parallel part. So to find a correlation matrix, um, you can, in R, you can use the core function. So the core function, um, you can give it two vectors if you want just to get a single correlation between those two vectors, but you can give it a whole matrix and it will create a correlation matrix for you. So there's our correlation matrix, and it uh, actually names the variables. So if your original matrix was named, then it will um, produce a named matrix as well. Ours was, so that's helpful because you can see, you know, correlation between Dow and Dow was one and things like that. You can also find eigenvectors and eigenvalues using the eigen function. You can also do this by hand. Um, you could do this by hand in R as well, but there's a built-in function, so we'll go with that for now. So we see that the eigenvalues, that's the dollar sign values, they're given there, not looking at those too much at the moment. And then the eigenvectors, we see there are those eigenvectors. So in Q7 and Q8, so you're going to um, have an assignment from the section, I think it's numbers 5 through 11, um, but don't quote me on that, check Moodle. In question seven and eight, the solutions, it turns out, are not unique. Any vector starting at zero, zero and going to some point A, A would represent the direction of the most variability. So how did we choose then? How did R come up with a certain set of numbers? You know, if we all ran the eigenfunction, we'd all get the same numbers. If any numbers will work, why didn't we all get different ones? Well, the specific values of each eigenvector are chosen by normalizing the vector. So what does normalizing mean? It means uh, the sum of the squared elements is going to equal 1. So here was some math for our example. Square root of 0.5 and square root of 0.5. That'll give us a 1. And note here, signs are completely arbitrary. So, um, you know, we've got two positive 0.707s in V1, we've got a negative 0.707 and a positive 0.707 in V2, it does not matter. So, um, you know, if you square, square a negative number, it becomes positive, so that really wouldn't uh, mess us up here. So signs are arbitrary. To calculate, so now we're, we're at the part, we've done a little review of linear algebra, 
both the notation and some of the methods. Now we are to creating principal components. So to create a principal component, you want to multiply the standardized data. Remember we said that part is important. You don't want any big um, variables kind of overwhelming everything. And there's a whole section in this chapter uh, that will talk about the importance of that later. For now, just remember, standardize. So we want to multiply the standardized data by each eigenvector using the following formula. So this is, um, again, just some matrix notation. So the first principle, or the ith principal component, y sub i, is equal to the standardized data matrix z times the ith eigenvector v sub i. And so what we see here, um, you know, you, we've got it written out. Each element of the eigenvector is getting multiplied by each vector of z. You could have written another line of this where we wrote things out in summation notation, uh, like what we're used to with those capital sigmas. But this is the wonderful thing about matrix notation. You could have ended at the third thing, just z times v sub i. That is so clean and nice and simple. And that's what uh, we really gain here is simplicity. It might not be the notation that you're used to, so at first it might not seem as simple, um, but it, in the long run it definitely will become something that you're a fan of. And you do this for um, all, you could do this for all of your eigenvectors to find all of your principal components. So here's that, what that would look like for our two new variables based on our little example. Uh, your homework has you walk through that so we won't get into it too much. And we can look at some plots. So on the left we have the plot of the standardized variables z1 and z2. On the right we have a plot of the principal components y1 and y2. Notice that this is giving us the same information, it's just rotated. So um, we haven't lost any information, we've just rotated what we had. And Earlier we saw that um, v1 and v2 were perpendicular to each other. That means that the principal components will also be perpendicular to each other. And to all other principal, like uh, any two principal components are going to be perpendicular. And that's important. Again, something that we'll um, talk about in more detail later in this chapter when we go to the interpreting section and things like that. But for now, um, just a couple notes on that. Any two variables that are standardized and perpendicular are uncorrelated. And remember, at the very beginning of this, we said our goal was we had a ton of variables. We want to see if we can reduce that by making new variables, which are linear combinations of the old ones and are uncorrelated to each other. So if there was any correlation going on, that would tell us, oh, maybe we don't need all of these variables. We can condense them in some way. And so. Um, we want to get rid of correlation and end up with a set of uncorrelated variables, and that's what PCA does for us. So um, that's kind of a big, uh, the big idea without getting too into the details there. So that's the end of section 10.3. Um, so kind of a kind of a dense section. Um, so there is, like, so there's some matrix algebra going on and some uh, review of there's a review of some linear algebra ideas, so really spend a little bit of time in this one, making sure you kind of see what's going on. Um, I didn't, uh, so you have homework uh, from this section, and it involves um, either working through some linear algebra type things on your own with R, or uh, watching the book work through it and understanding what they do. And so I would really urge you on this one, uh, don't wait until the last second, kind of look at this one early. That way, if you have any issues, you can kind of catch them early and we can work that out. So I will see you next time in section 10.4.